at times, this entire team at Dell consisted of two people and a dog. Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Ben Stone, joined every week by Jill Bryan and everybody watching at home live on oh, Twitch. How's it going? Beautiful time. Having a... I'm not going to say I'm having a good time. I'm watching a bunch of people running around, terrified, petrified, stupefied, mortified, confused as to why their ad blockers are no longer working. They're getting pop-ups on YouTube. YouTube's <laughs> like, you better get rid yeah. of that ad blocker. Three strikes and you're out, man. And they're mm -hmm. updating their ad blockers and it's coming back. Terrible time. Terrible yeah. time. Fine. I told you this was coming. I did. Yeah, you did. Actually, right here on the show. Nobody listens to me. And I said, here it comes. <laughs> That's a couple of months ago. And I said, I was like, no, don't worry about it, man. I got ad blockers. Things going to work. Now, something I touched on on Saturday. If you want to go back and listen to Linux Gamecast Weekly, this isn't the switch getting flipped at all. Like, there's the on button for advertisements. That sucks. But mm -hmm. one thing I'm going to start doing is some I've been playing around with on uh, if you're a patron, I got the option just to like upload a regular video straight to patron, patreon.com. So I'm going to start doing it for this show and Linux Gamecast. So if you want like the ad-free video for that, now of course you can use the, um, what is that, like YouTube DLP and all the other things if you want to uh, work around that. But if you just want to pop in and watch a produced version, download it, whatever, we're going to make sure you're taken care of. So don't worry about how much. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jill, uh, what yeah. you been up to? Oh boy. Well, I just wanted to say how much fun I had yesterday. We had some really quirky new practice maps to play for a Trackmania Stadium 2 stream yesterday, and I really, really enjoyed them. I love the, the unique ones with the unique mechanics. It makes it an interesting puzzle. But Joe, we need to get right into it this week because okay. a blast from the past <laughs> has returned to yeah. a desktop, or is, I should say, as of two days ago, was heading back to a certain desktop experience. Yeah, absolutely. So you remember the Compez 3D desktop cube effect? We, where we could show off our friends to demonstrate the power of Linux and make Windows users jealous? Well, now that is available for KWIN in the KDE Plasma desktop. And the main reason I want to bring this up, everybody, is uh, this is something that has gotten merged in as of two days ago. Yay! So th there we go. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to see. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, um, I'm looking at like straight as like, hey, didn't was there a cube effect? Honestly, I don't know. I know the cube effect's been around uh, when the K win uh, effects cube, but according to this, um, it's now like an official real thing. It's kind of one of those weird things when you got to go back in time and think about yeah. when. When did we have Compiz? And when was that? Like 2005, 2006, somewhere? Yeah. There? Yeah. 2005, 2006. Was kind of I, then I, <laughs> I actually remember showing it uh, to a lot, of the, a lot of Windows users, and they were confused because, see, they, they didn't understand virtual desktops. <laughs> mm. So, you know, having a, a, a you know, when it was say you had four virtual desktops and having one on each side of the cube, you know, for them, it was confusing because they didn't know what that was. So then you had to explain what a virtual desktop was. <laughs> I think that was one of the things that we never saw a lot of adoption with the cube because most people don't use virtual desktops. Yeah, I know. I know. Most of them don't. <laughs> we don't. I mean, that was always before the cube when it came to like virtual desktops. You know, we've had that option forever and even yeah. in the most basic Windows man window managers for Linux. But, you know, it was one of the mm -hmm. things that you could show off like, hey, I could use this desktop, this desktop, this desktop. And uh, you never really used them. And the cube was neat. You're like, I put stuff here and put stuff here and put stuff here. I can spin it around. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it just kind of faded away into obscurity. But hey, I mean, it's officially back. Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's kind of neat. I just wanted to give that a quick mention at the top of the show. I, I thought it was like, I, I saw that show up and I'm like, hey, it's finally been merged into, yes. uh, into the cube <laughs> as a new effect into plasma. Oh, I'm like, all right. 
pretty decent. Very cool. So, mm -hmm. Ubuntu. We got the Ubuntu conference thing coming up, right? Yeah, Ubuntu Summit in Europe. In oh, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of the country. I shouldn't forget Latvia. the name. Of the Latvia. Yeah, that's it. Latvia, <laughs> home of Microtech. Yeah, home of Microtech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it would be a good time to take a look at how Ubuntu snuck into Dell laptops. This is something that happened. We, mm -hmm. we forget about it. You almost yeah. might take it for granted in today's time that you can kind of just get a laptop, maybe not with Linux on it from Dell or HP, but you can definitely get one without Windows. And at the time, we were going out of our way to avoid paying the Windows tax if we were buying a pre-built PC, and it was not necessarily an easy thing to do. This is a nice little write-up from ZDNet, because I went looking around. I'm like, even today, let's be real, if we got to go to Dell, um, you got to look for like developer editions for the XPSs if you want to get a Linux laptop, but it's doable. You know, there's not too many hoops you got to go through. And, uh, you know, even better yet, even better yet, now, when you get an Ubuntu laptop from Dell, you don't have to drop out of college, Jill. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, it's, th it's... This, this was a real story that happened, um, what was it, 14 years ago? Like somebody accidentally ordered an Ubuntu. I, I don't even know. This, this smells like Microsoft FUD from back in the day. But um, apparently, a student ordered a laptop and ended up with Linux on it. And they, they couldn't complete their coursework. And uh, I, I have a lot of questions about that. But let's go ahead and just kind of get back to this. Uh, this does a really good job of talking about somebody you might know, Barton. Barton George. And yeah. how he started just a small internal team. That at times, this entire team at Dell consisted of two people and a dog. Yeah. And <laughs> it was kind of difficult because they were talking about he was trying to pitch it. He was like, hey, let's just do a developer thing for thing. And they said, man, how many do you plan on selling? And I'm like, well, you know, maybe a reasonable amount, a couple. And uh, I'm like, no, 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 we, we sell more volume laptops than that in like this small country by 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on a yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> so they weren't terribly interested in it. But it was enough, you know, to get, I think they ended up with like forty thousand dollars of uh, just initial internal funding. I'm like, here, side project, go play around with it. Barton was able to get a hold of Ubuntu, rag them up. I said, hey, we work with us and make sure we get all the drivers and all the bits that we need to get our laptop up and working with Ubuntu. And mm -hmm. Ubuntu did a solid. And uh, they said, all right, let's try this out. We're gonna we're gonna launch a developer laptop, ten percent off. You know, to incentivize people see who's out there they were expecting about 300 orders and then, this would be pretty good you know super niche yeah. product we'll get it out there for testing a couple hundred <laughs> people will pick it up and it immediately ended with six thousand orders yay like what they didn't expect that so that was a big enough signal that little bit right there that little blip of like wait a minute there's money to be made here so they were able to move on the project george was able to take what was effectively a prototype that they had, you know, just a small couple of hundred to get out there. That idea to a full product in, uh, you know, this was Skunk Works inside of Dell. They yeah. were able to get that together as a shipped product in about nine months. So what are <laughs> then, your thoughts on Project Sputnik? Yeah, so, you know, we've actually been talking about Barton George and his Project Sput Sputnik and its progress, you know, honestly, since I've been here on LWW since 2018. Because it's huge Linux news, you know, getting getting Linux on a mainstream, you know, retail, uh, <laughs> huge retailer a laptop like Dell. Um, and it is amazing what he and his team have achieved. And actually, he did it kind of quickly, too, <laughs> all things considered. One of my favorite quotes from Barton George in the blog about the Dell Ubuntu developer laptop key to success was he states we created a rough image that people could use on the xps 13 
developers could download it and start working on it. We told people there were a lot of caveats and it wasn't an official release, not nor supported. But the key thing here is why you couldn't do this with consumers, with developers who knew it was a beta, then you're okay. And we had most of the bugs worked out. So that's, you know, that, that, that's a, a great, great way to go to Linux users, you know? <laughs> You know, because we're used to uh, working on on things that are in beta and with with software and with hardware. So that that was brilliant <laughs> to go straight to the developers <laughs> who are used to to playing with their uh, hardware. <laughs> One of the things that we again we just take for granted these days because if you need a laptop and you want Linux on it and you need it to be supported, you have options these days. And if you've ever ran in, and it can still be a problem, especially inside of, uh, you know, company on laptops. Unfortunately, that's why yeah. a lot of people end up with Macs because you'd rather have a Mac than whatever, you know, poo book that they wanted to give you from whoever. And so I just thought this was a nice trip down memory lane of how that yeah. took place. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's nice when a small team can get together inside of a large corporation and affect some change like that. And it benefits us. Mm hmm. Good times for all. Jill has some news about Firefox 119, which is one version better than 118. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, Mozilla Firefox 119 web browser mm -hmm. is now available to download with some very cool new features. One of my favorite new features are the improvements to the Firefox view panel, which you select by hitting the Firefox icon in the top left corner of your tabs. Firefox View lets you access pages from other devices, such as your phone or another computer that is turned on. And what's cool is it now shows recently closed tabs and browsing history, which you can organize by date or by site. And it adds support for viewing all open tabs from all your windows and all the tabs from all synced devices. So it allows you to view multiple tabs and windows uh, from your synced uh, Firefox browser, which is really cool. <laughs> I've been using that feature a lot since it came out in 2022. So it's really nice. And the other big news here is that Firefox 119 lets you import your Chrome extensions, at least the ones that are available on the Firefox add-in add-on site and I did try this and most of the extensions I used are on Firefox so it worked very well and uh, this release also now allows the ability to edit P PDFs by adding images before you could add drawings and of course text but now you can add images to the PDFs as well and edit them right in the Firefox web browser Edit PDFs. So, you know, yeah. fortunately, I've not made life choices bad enough to where I've had to edit a PDF. Really, with PDFs for me, the only time I run across PDFs is manuals these days. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, I don't have to edit manuals, which is always, let's just be honest, let's just hope PDFs eventually die. At some point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it's never been my favorite format, but, you know, that's what a lot of businesses use to circulate data information <laughs> so that's what we get stuck with <laughs> i know I, I would like a something to come and replace it because you know as much as i loathe pdfs i don't loathe pdfs i like whatever I, I, i've been beaten into submission with them like whatever fine i will take a pdf any day over a poorly scanned manual from 30 years ago yeah very true you know and, and it is better than microfish <laughs> it is yeah. <laughs> 100%. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we were wondering when we were going to get some Raspberry Pis. Yeah. Some Pi 5. And here they are. They're available now. Not really. But yeah, they're getting ready to ship them out. <laughs> four and eight gig Pis are going to start showing up next week. If you pre order. If you pre-ordered, if you had some of that FOMO and you get your pre-orders in, well, all right, pretty decent. The rest of you, people like me, us peasants, you're going to have to wait a couple of months. Yeah, they're going to start showing up in channels, but that's still good news. 
that's still good news. I thought we'd let everybody know about that. I opted mm-hmm. not pre-order Raspberry Pi. I was on the page. And it wasn't the pre-order. I don't have any problems with people pre-ordering. Like, do what you want to do, right? That, that doesn't yeah. bother me. Mm-hmm. And for an item like this that you know is going to be difficult to get a hold to, getting a pre-order in from a vendor, I was more curious as to... Because all of the places that I found that had pre-orders had like very strict, um, or at least up front, like you can get one and that's it. And we're not going to let, we're going to check you and make sure that you're not trying to order seven or eight because you got to worry about scalpers, right? Yeah. That didn't do too much Makes to sense. stop them. Yeah. Yeah. Ben the just found this. Raspberry <laughs> Pi fives on eBay already. <laughs> so if you, if you don't feel like waiting for your pre-order and you still got that FOMO, you can get one. <laughs> order a Raspberry Pi 5 right now for $188. Yeah. And you're thinking to yourself, then, well, that's just somebody got a hold of one early. Nah, they had seven of them. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how they got, you know, they obviously were press and got a hold of a bunch of them. And... Oh, I don't think they sent press seven. Jill. Yeah. I, this is like pre order stock that somebody slid to the side. For an incredible amount of money. Uh, this is the last one. So how many did they have? They only had three. Mm-hmm. $189 right now. And you can pick up a Pi 5 8 gig. Now, are we looking into the future, people? Is, is Are we getting ready for round two of Scalp Mageddon? Because we're all <laughs> a little sensitive about scalper prices on Raspberry Pis. Because unless you were a company with a contractor, however, that worked with the Raspberry Pi Foundation. You couldn't get one for the past couple of years, and you ended up paying yeah. $180. One of the reasons I didn't do that video on the uh, Jitsi server for the Raspberry Pi 4 for a couple of years was because it didn't make any sense. Because if you wanted a Raspberry Pi 4, it was going to cost you $180. And I'm like, that's why would you do that? You would just go buy a, like a cheap Dell business PC, which is going to be faster and mm-hmm. cost $99. Hopefully, this is like a very limited thing. Hopefully, but I wouldn't expect to see. But why I didn't pre order back to that's because do the right thing, wait for the good cases to show up and the peripherals. Software is probably ecosystem is going to be in good shape, it's going to be there. And um, I would probably say we'll know how effective or how serious Raspberry Pi was about you know limiting pre order and available stock to customers and fighting scalping by. February, but Raspberry Pi would like you to know <laughs> just how fast this Pi 5 is while you're sitting around waiting. They did a article about benchmarking it, and I'm like, yeah. okay, that's pretty good. Geek bench, bench numbers. I'm like, all right, all right. I like to see why is only the Raspberry Pi 4 and the benchmark against the Raspberry Pi 5. <laughs> <sighs> okay. So you're taking the time to benchmark it and brace yourself kids the raspberry pi 5 is in fact faster than the raspberry pi 4 yeah all right (laughs) didn't expect that that comes as a shock to no one like like okay i mean i guess this is a useful Mm -hmm. metric in some way shape form or fashion what i was curious about and i think a lot of you at home is because we just talked about this gap this past couple of years where you just really couldn't justify buying a Raspberry Pi 5 because they were so expensive. What have we been doing? Uh, We've been buying all the alternatives, (laughs) the orange pies, the banana pies. (laughs) Rock chip based stuff. Yeah. Been on the market, you know, and it wasn't $75, but you know, something we've talked about on the show a lot is, you know, these boards were, you know, they have more features. They were newer. They've, they've been updated more recently. They, they were like yeah. $100, $120, but they also had like 8 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of RAM, NVMe drives built into them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really cool. what I wanted to see. The Raspberry Pi 5 stacked up again. So I headed over to Geekbench. And <laughs> uh, let's see how a Pi 5 matches up against the Orange Pi 5B, which I think is like the legitimate competitor. Like the next SBC um, I buy is going to be an Orange Pi. Just play around with it. And it's not that bad. Yeah. You know? No, the, I was really impressed by the single core uh, performance. 
I mean, the Raspberry Pi 5 does is 2.40 gigahertz versus the Orange Pi is 1.80 gigahertz. So it does make sense that it would be, you know, faster in single core, but it, it, it it's 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 not bad. Even even on multi core, it's you know the 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 Orange Pi 5B actually has um, eight threads as opposed to the Raspberry Pi 5's four threads, but it it the Raspberry Pi still holds up with it. Not in multi core, Jill. <laughs> not on all. Yeah, not, not on at all. all period. <laughs> I mean, you you can't you can't stretch that. There's almost a sixty percent performance. Yeah, difference. you're right about that. Like, yeah, that, that, you can you can't gloss over that. You're just being yeah. Um, but single core performance is is pretty cool when you consider there's a lot of apps that single core is not bad, but it's yeah. But again, the Raspberry Pi five mm-hmm. doesn't always win in single yeah. core. Now, <laughs> this is what you gotta this is what you gotta take in consideration, though. The Orange Pi 5 is going to run you about 120 bucks. Where mm-hmm. this is where the price, performance, the value proposition of the Raspberry Pi 5 all yeah. hinges on availability. So if we can get, if, if you at home are able to get a Raspberry Pi 5 for MSRP, which, what was it, 80 bucks? Mm-hmm. $85? Then you can't really beat that because that's a lot of oomph for the buck. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what you got to keep in mind here. However, uh, if you end up having to pay $180, like we were just looking at on eBay for Raspberry Pi 5, you w- there's no point, you know. You wouldn't buy it. That's something yeah. you want to keep in mind, everybody. I mean, it all depends yeah. on availability with the Raspberry Pi 5. Because, you know, the single board computer... E- SBC ecosystem didn't take a break these past couple of years. They've been innovating and doing stuff. And there, there's things, you know, choices that they had to make with Raspberry Pi 5 to keep it within budget. You know, there's things yeah. that I really wanted to see, like a built in NVMe slot. I think that would have been nice. They went with a ribbon connector, which is going to be that's passing the expense on to the hat or the add on board, which is going to add to the complexity of the case and however that's going to stick together. But whatever. Mm-hmm. Whatever, if they can ship it for like 80 bucks and you can get it in distribution channels for that price, it's a beautiful product. It is very performant for the price. And again, the ecosystem is very well fleshed out. That's one thing Raspberry Pi has over everybody else. Yeah. The community and the ecosystem is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's all open source too, which makes it a lot easier to develop apps for the board and, and everything. So that's definitely something. And um, actually, I have the Raspberry Pi 5 right here. <laughs> it showed it off a couple of weeks ago here on LWW when I got it. But I have noticed just a huge speed increase with my Raspberry Pi 5, just using the desktop and surfing web pages compared to my Raspberry Pi 400, which I had overclocked from 1.8 gigahertz to 1.9 gigahertz when I got it back in 2020. This, this screen, this kills that little computer, the Raspberry Pi 400. So I'm sure they're going to be putting this in a keyboard also and maybe call it the Raspberry Pi 500. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I mean, imagine how much better it's going to be when it's not constantly thermal throttling. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has that little fan and (laughs) <laughs> everything because in its this current state really right cool. now you plug that thing in it immediately thermal throttles yeah it does it does so um i haven't put put uh the the heat sink and little fan on it yet but i plan to and um i want to do some serious benchmarking if they if they can keep availability if it doesn't end up and just completely the domain of scalpers which this is a valid concern. This is what we've been dealing with the past couple of years. You know, definitely pick one up. Like you can't beat the price performance at 80 bucks, but it's a non-starter if it, you end up having to pay 150, 160 bucks for yeah. i5. Yeah. Like absolutely. it just doesn't make sense as a product at that, unless you were tied into the ecosystem. Hopefully that's not going to be the case. More importantly, I think um, we're going to see better availability for the Raspberry Pi 4s. You know? Nice. 
Yeah, and they'll they'll be the cheaper boards you can grab at the store or online. Ah, uh, I think the tree person's gone. Yes. Moral of the story. <laughs> if you can get your hands on Raspberry Pi 5 at retail, it's a great value. Go pick one up. But that's going to do it for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for showing up, watching <laughs> us live, all the beautiful party patrons making this show possible. If you want to help us out, head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. Come check out a bunch of things. In fact, I got an entire page stuck together that you can uh, peruse. If you want to share the show, pick up some merch, kick us something off of our Amazon wish list. We got you covered. We even got humble affiliate links hiding down at the bottom. We get a little bit of that action. But we'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. Maybe you're listening to this on a Thursday, and that's not confusing at all. Why? Because you can do basic days. Do you, do you call it doing days, Joe? Yeah, doing days. <laughs> doing days. All right. Time for some credits, everybody. <laughs> Yay. We made it through it. <laughs> Despite, despite some annoyances from the uh, tree trimmers in front of my house. <laughs> oh, thank you to our advisors, Omegas and our Theron in chat. And our executive producers. And our Chicago level people. And our awesome sea monsters. There's lots of them now. <laughs> it's awesome. And our death notes. And our chairlings and Gamatron, Ralph9900, Don M, Steve Husband, Strider. Hey, beautiful people. We'll see you next week. Have a great, I don't know. What do you want to call it? Day. Day, days. Yeah. Venice Day. That's what Arthur calls it. <laughs>